this podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Patreon is a monthly subscription that you can cancel anytime. And PayPal is a one-time donation. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the handle, The Beirut Banyan. And you can find us on our YouTube channel with the same name. And you can start watching the episodes as they're released. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. I'm Rani Shatah. And this is The Beirut Banyan. Sada, I can't imagine what it's like to spend an afternoon, evening, teaching a course, dealing with students, whether it's COVID or crisis, whatever. And then, rather than just sort of dozing off to some boring show or just sort of drifting away, you're still up to deal with someone like me. So, it's a privilege. <laughs> It's an honor. I, uh, I'm glad it worked out. Uh, it's a tense time, and you were very generous. You were willing to speak uh, very quickly. So I really appreciate that. I also like that the backdrop is literally what you're dealing with during the day, your AUV course. So that's, uh, that's you know, sort of adds to the moment a bit. I, I, clearly, I don't have an AUV course to deal with. <laughs> your words resonate with me. And uh, I don't think we've ever met. I don't think we've spoken to each other. We don't know each other, but we're obviously, we're sort of the way Beirut functions. We know many people. For me, because I've read so many pieces that reflect on Beirut, whether it's this time around or, or earlier sort of periods of, uh, of unrest, of stress, uh, I think uh, maybe I tend to skim through. But your piece, your recent piece in Jampuria, I read it several times. And uh, that's really the reason I reached out to you, is because I think... It's a, certain, it's a certain way of remembering that this is not new, and at the same time, this moment is extremely painful, and it stands out. But the fact is, this is a cycle. And you took me back to earlier chapters, um, whether it's Hadidi's assassination in 2005, or whether it's shared suffering, whether it's Syrians, whether it's us, our parents, our grandparents, I mean, it's, it's a cycle that we can't break. It also took me back to a quote that I used to end my tour with, Samir Asir quote. It's, Audu ta'audu illa It's a well-known quote, but it sort of reflects, I think, it's going to be the core. Uh, it's the cycle of stability and instability, and then prosperity and despair. And I think you found a way of sort of bringing it home and then the larger picture, of course, is perpetual return. And I'm in the middle of this. I think maybe that's why it sort of it struck me personally is that I'm doing this dance all the time. I don't think I want to dance this dance, but I do. And I think uh, most people reluctantly are forced to make these choices over and over and over. It's a very long introduction, but uh, I kind of just wanted to share that from my side because meant a lot. And uh, I'm going to link the, the piece to the episode. It's The Great Lebanese Exile, Chronicles of a Perpetual Return. It's timely. Um, it's after the port blasts. And it's <laughs> right in the middle of a paralysis un unheard of. I mean, it's almost like every day things get worse and worse and worse. Anyway, I, I want to get maybe your immediate reaction to what we're seeing right now. And I mean this actually literally the last 24 hours. Uh, you have pressure from abroad. You have pressure from within. You have old negotiations that don't last. They don't work anymore. You have old ways of governing that are so unfit for the moment. The back door deal, the backroom dealings are not happening. And there's what appears to be an ungovernable situation. So as somebody who's literally in, in Beirut right now dealing with this sort of paralysis, I want to get your, maybe your sort of your personal take. Do, do you see this as a sort of a fait accompli, that things are so bad right now that 
maybe the cycle doesn't matter anymore, that we're stuck in stagnation. And that old cliche about that phoenix that keeps rising, it's just not going to rise. That maybe we are entering literally a failed state, very difficult to get out of. And it's a big question, and you say as, as much as you'd like. It's a very, it's a very big question, and uh, that sense of paralysis, I think, is uh, is not new. Uh, and you know, we experience, you know, every few years you have a deadlock, you have a standstill, uh, um, and uh, I think what's what's different this time is that uh, this is happening. Uh, in, in the middle and in the aftermath of uh, catastrophes like we've never seen before. Yeah. So um, catastrophes, but also, um, you know, in the aftermath of an uprising, the largest popular up uprising that the country has witnessed in its yeah. modern history. So in light of these monumental events, uh, the fact that, as you said, we're standing still in that same spot, uh, uh, hearing of the same kind of deadlocks, uh, seeing the same kind of old ways of governing or, you know, ungoverning, um, is is what is really um, mind-boggling now. Because, you know, when you when you face such tragedies, um, what you expect and what you feel in the moment is that this is it. Things will yeah. never be the same again, right? Yeah. We have seen, we have lived what we've never lived before. And every time you feel this and you feel the intensity uh, of these emotions and you, you face the magnitude of the situation and then you are confronted with business as usual, with right. you know, reality, you know it. And I think this is what really causes a sort of shock because in a moment you feel like, Khalas, nothing is the same again. And here you are again, waiting for people to agree on what minister to name for what ministry. Right. right? You're back yeah. in that hole. I like that you use the word hole. And you also used a, another word in the piece, which is trapped. And I, I'd like to quote you to you here. We are trapped by the banks that have swallowed our money and a global pandemic that has made travel practically impossible. We are trapped, but we are also trapping others with us. For months since the beginning of the economic meltdown, migrant workers living in Lebanon have been trying to leave. Unpaid by their employers, evicted by their landlords, and abandoned by their governments and consulates. They are desperate to be repatriated, having lost all possibilities of life here. The country is on the verge of a mass exodus. For me, the sense of being literally locked and unable to change what's happening, I think stands out. And in previous crises, I don't think I ever felt that trapped feeling or that we were so deep in a hole that we couldn't get out. And I sense that this time around, it almost is, I don't know if you can easily compare it to a civil war-like environment, but it, it harkens back to those stories parents and even grandparents share that it's just uh it's a big mess and it's very difficult to see any light at the end of the tunnel and i also like that you shared a bit of your own story that uh and, and we'll get to this that you are in a way you trapped yourself this time around deliberately um you sort of reflected on being abroad watching the Houston crisis and you feel sort of this irrelevant feeling being abroad, but then sort of purpose comes back to haunt you and you settle back in Lebanon a year later. Same thing happened to me. I was abroad watching these protests and the way you described it sort of, it's so, it fits the moment. You're not watching it on meet on cable news or any uh, media subscription channel. You're watching it on your phone and that's been defining the moment right now. But you also took me back to a time much earlier than the smartphone or Instagram or Twitter, to the 2005 assassination, Hadid's assassination. You were in high school, and people were whispering, and they couldn't figure out what happened, and exaggerating, and the professor trying to calm people down, saying it's a gas leak, gas explosion. I was in a class as well, albeit university. I'm a bit older than you, I think. But I, I was in the same kind of setting that I... Uh, yeah, you hear sort of, you don't know what's happening. 
And then you're confronted with a reality that I think ends what should have been our post-war environment, which is stability and prosperity, rather than a return to violence. I don't know if 2020 is the end of the road per se, but it feels like it's the end of the post-war story. And that the post-war story isn't really a post-war story. It's a sort of a continuation of certain chapters of the Civil War that we never really got rid of. Does that resonate with you? That, that defining us as a post-war generation may be incomplete and that we are literally trapped now in that monster. And that monster is, is older than 1990 until today. It goes back to the 1970s and 1980s. Again, a huge question. But does that stick, does that resonate with you? That we are sort of, uh, we're at the end of something fundamental and our generation is just, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't move on from the worst legacies of, of war. I think the, the postness in the post-war is what deserves to be uh, thought out because mm. it's post in the sense of uh, coming in the wake right coming in yeah. the wake of an coming in the wake of war and so definitively shaped by that war marked by that war um, and as i said our consciousness as the generation that uh, uh, grew up that c came to be after the war uh, is forged it's forged in the aftermath of this event that we didn't witness ourselves we didn't live through right. yes um, but whose memory uh, is mediated to us through our parents um, and so, yes, we're after, we, we've come after this, uh, this event, but as you said, it didn't really end um, because we know that the people who have um, overseen, you know, the demise now, who have engineered all of these crises um, are themselves the lords of war. They're the same yeah. people. And so the idea, and, and they came at a time, I mean, they imposed their own peace on the people at a time when the people uh, uh, wanted nothing more than for the war to end, right? They would settle for anything. And this reminds me, this, uh, um, um, uh, you know, experience of, of desperation, of, of willing to take whatever deal is presented to you, um, that our parents lived through, this is the end of the 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Um, this is what we're feeling in a way now. There's a sense of give me anything, give me a solution, but a way out. And these are the dangerous times in which, you know, they, uh, um, they um, dispossess us of everything. And then, you know, they dangle a carrot and they just, you know, yeah. you have to take it. And so I think this is what these people who have been in power, who remained in power, uh, they, they, drive us to the, you know, to the edge of despair, and then uh, um, it's uh, uh, impose uh, whatever it is that they actually want on us yet again. You know, I, which I, is a, that's not that clearly will not work for us, that will clearly not bring us justice. I, I'm, I'm glad you're using the word justice from now. And I, I also want to go back a bit to, I think you described it as a, a fragile piece, post-war fragile piece. And I like that because that's not how you should emerge 15 years after a civil war. It shouldn't be that fragile anymore. And it's so fragile. You also hearken back to the parents who made decisions similar to what we're making now. And I'll quote you to you again. For our parents who stayed, for those who lived through the endless cycles of violence only to find themselves driven again and again to the edge of despair, our departure becomes a fate they prepared for, one they hoped for, and even planned on our behalves. Do you think that justice is the issue and that we never really reconciled what tore the country apart? And we inherited a post, a fragile post-war order that wasn't necessarily our fragile post-war order. It was maybe the, uh, the worst of the war generation that took the reins after the war. And they kind of created their own post-war order fragile at best, but it wasn't meant to rebuild the country. It was a temporary piece, as you said. I mean, does, does justice, at the end of the day, is, is that the core issue that is keeping Lebanon sort of uh, ungovernable and in the condition it is today in 2020? 
of course, we what we are missing is justice because we're always living on the brink of uh, survival, right? Where the, the the point or what we're striving to do is surviving. Yeah. Whether it's surviving the war, surviving the violence, surviving uh, an economic meltdown, a financial collapse, uh, sur- um, surviving. Uh, um, uh, um, everyday sort of kind of in, uh, instability, uh, so different kinds of violence, uh, uh, physical or economic, you name it. So if it's always a matter of survival, what gets eclipsed in the process is the the, the quest for justice and the ability to seek uh, to seek justice. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is, uh, just as you know, with with what's been happening recently is. We're glad we're alive, and um, yeah. we're also too tired because you, everything is falling apart, right? Nothing, there's nothing there. Yeah. So, so yeah, ultimately, you're you're by the time you get to you know seeking justice, you're somehow burnt out. I want to ask you a, and now this is a personal question from from your side because you you returned to Lebanon, and you returned knowing that there was despair already. I think you, in a way, you hinted at that, that the New Stink movement had already winded down by the time you had sort of settled in, but that you were waiting, and many people were waiting for the next round. The, the fact that the, so many things were already horrible prior to October 17th last year, but when you witnessed sort of the, in a way, a last cry of the post-war order, of people going back to the streets, and I, and I like the way you kind of you describe it in, a, in an almost funny way that this American is in a theater performing a solo act, and <laughs> I may be jumping pieces here. This this could be the uh, rusted radishes uh, piece, but regard- no, that's right. That's, that's this one. Oh, it's the same one. Good, good. Yeah, because yeah. I, I kind of jumped back and forth a bit, and I like that. In a way, they link. They are in a way the same story. It's just sort of overlapping. But I like the way you describe her. Sort of, she's offended that the Lebanese are leaving her. She almost she takes it personally, but <laughs> I'm sure within hours she realized it was not <laughs> intended it's not against. About, it's not about it's her. Not about her. It was may have been a great performance, but <laughs> just wrong wrong timing. <laughs> but but the fact is, you get up from your seat. You're in a car. You're joining friends. You're on the streets, and you vividly describe what I remember I, myself on the streets. The fire, the scooters, the chance overnight, and things are clearly changing once more. Did you sense anything in your heart at that moment that this is a temporary respite? That the pattern is so familiar that this may just be a moment of euphoria and that's it? That things simply cannot change in this country? Or is it the le- is it sort of an opposite end feeling where you really thought that things are going to change this time around. And the reason for you returning was sort of lived up to that you're now witnessing a real moment. Because I, I'm curious what your take is. Having, having returned, knowing that there's this continued cycle and having left an otherwise stable life in, in the States, I mean, did you see this as as that moment, or or were you more cautious? And I'm talking literally. I'm talking the first hours, maybe the first days, not the pessimism that sunk in later, the initial euphoria. What what was your sort of, what was your personal reaction to that? So I wasn't uh, here in 2015, so I had no uh, nothing to compare this to, mm-hmm. which was different from uh, my friends who were with me, because to them. As we were walking towards uh, Riyadh al-Salah, there was something. Uh, it was as if they were taken back in time. There was something that they were comparing this to. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't have this experience, but right. it was something. I mean, the feeling in downtown Beirut. Downtown Beirut is, in, you know, uh, dark, empty. There is no one there. So yeah. the sheer number of people and the light, uh, the light that's coming out of the, you know, the fire. Um, that's really what uh, I mean. What we, what, what you saw, and how you felt, and then the sounds of the metal. Yeah. Um, this was new to me. So, 
uh, it was euphoric and that lasted for uh, four weeks because it's uh, we weren't sleeping uh, we were barely eating um, and we were on the street all the time and it was a relationship to the street that I've never felt before and to people around me that I've never felt before and no matter what actually happened and how things unfolded this feeling will never go away um, and I was so grateful uh, that I got to experience it. And w was there ever a creeping sort of discomfort that this would be a short-lived moment? Or, or were you able to put that to the side and just embrace what was happening right then and there? And I, I'd like to compare this because I, I, in a way, experienced something very similar. And I also had this sort of, this is short-lived. But I'm, I'm curious mm. for you. Like, and I'm talking really the first weekend, Thursday, Friday, yeah. Saturday. Yeah. So, so obviously there's a, the fear, how did it manifest itself or, or what did it mean for it to be short-lived? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the eyes were constantly on the streets. So when yeah. we were not in the street, we would turn on the TV to check that we still had the multiple screens on. You, you remember right. that yeah, sure. long yeah. we had eight yeah. different uh, boxes, you know, from different yeah. towns and cities across. That, that site was, was so heartening and that's what... You know, you would wake up in the morning, turn on, turn on the TV, uh, just to make sure the people are still there. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so for the first, uh, you know, the first week, couple of weeks, this was it. It was, we need to, how long can we remain in the street? And we didn't, you know, I didn't really think beyond that. It was, mm -hmm, how, mm -hmm. much can we, how much can we stand our ground? How much will we stay? Right. So you, in a way, you were able to fully embrace the positivity without letting the usual cycle creep back in. You were able yes. to sort of separate the two. I bring this up because you used a phrase, an irrational optimism. And I think I, think I had irrational optimism and rational pessimism. <laughs> and I'm, I'm saying this from my side. Um, I think time matters. And I was disillusioned that maybe by Monday, this is four days into the protests, that very fundamental change should have taken hold. And I was, I felt it. And I think uh, the longer things draw out in the Lebanese context, the quicker things go back to the abnormal. And I, I think I was expecting from, from the first night, or let's say the first weekend, I really thought there would be a storming of the gates. And that maybe that is the moment it should happen. And it, it didn't happen. And that's where that rational pessimism comes in. And from previous experiences, and I think that includes, even though like you, I wasn't in, in, in Lebanon during that you stink protest. I was around in March, 2005, or 2005 in general, all the things that were happening. And I think time also, it just takes too long to, to make, time is a curse in Lebanon. I think it just automatically, the familiarity comes back and the old ways come back and they come back very quickly. So did, did that, did, did any of that happen to you that, because what you're saying is, is true. The, the persistence months afterwards, people were still on the streets. And the split screens and everything about Tripoli and Nabatiye and all that stuff. I mean, that was really, that was magic. And then by January, it had taken a very negative sort of bleak turn. And then COVID, in a way, made it very difficult to, to persist beyond that. And I kind of felt this helplessness, actually, that... Uh, if things don't happen quick, they won't happen, period. Am I being too bleak? Because I, we have, in a way, a shared, shared sort of, shared prism of being back and forth, back and forth, and then choosing to settle in Lebanon once more. So I'm, I'm curious about that. What, uh, was there any, a hint, any hint of negativity in, in the initial stretch? Of course. And it's, it's again, back to this, um, the, 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 the scene of protest or the, the bodies in the squares that wouldn't leave. Um, for a while, this is what 
made us feel that things were still happening. But I think at a certain point, it becomes a spectacle and it becomes yes. this ritual, right? It right. becomes a ritual and a little, you know, slowly it starts to lose its edge. Um, what is surprising about it, it loses its like confrontational, uh, violent also edge. So it becomes a sort of national, you know, spectacle of national uh, uh, um, belonging or of nationalism in general. So the moment it turns it's, and, it, and quick, you know, it started quickly transforming into that. But the moment it became a sort of uh, nationalist spectacle that you can contain, um, it lost uh, um, and it became repetitive and right. expected. So everyone knew, you know, what role they were playing. The security forces knew exactly what they were doing. They yeah. knew exactly where people would come and go. And it became, uh, you know, you would, it's like a carnival almost. So the, the, the carnivalesque element at the beginning is what really um, makes you feel, sense this euphoria. But then with time, it becomes... You can't, you know, you surpass it. You're stuck there. You're stuck in that moment. Absolutely. But spe spectacle, that's a great word for descript describing that moment. It's almost like a celebration that can't last that long. By default, people will go home. But I, 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 I without trying to sound too negative, um, I think these are not moments to party. Even if the partying is well-placed, the partying should be very quick, and then the pain should kick in very quickly. And the pain is really embracing fundamental change. And I just don't think that that happens soon enough. Even when all the discussions are still on that, even today, when people are still sort of pushing and persisting. But it seems with every day that passes, change is less and less likely. You know, I, I like the way you ended the piece. And it's very fresh. I mean, you're talking about Flash, the dog. And that hoping for some sign of life beneath the rubble. I took that, and you tell me if I'm wrong here. I took that as us looking for some sign of life in the whole moment. That October 17, there's like that beating heart, and you dig deep enough, and there's no life. Am I, am I being too romantic in assuming that that's the broader story, that we're looking for something that isn't there? And you say as much as you'd like about that. I think, I mean, I, I like your reading. I think I agree with it. It's the constant search for signs of life. I wouldn't say we're looking for something that's, I mean, even if we know that it's, even if we know it's not there in the sense of, there's a sense of impossibility that's now very deep. It doesn't matter because we have we have no other choice but to keep uh, but to keep looking. Um, I say, you know, for some, uh, not looking anymore means leaving. Right. And uh, as long as you're here, you will be uh, you will still be waiting and you will still be uh, looking. And signs of life are everywhere in the small things and the things that are a little bigger. It's uh, so they're there. And I think um, it's always, you know, when, what do they amount to together, maybe. May I ask you, though, and I don't want to sound too intrusive here, but what do they amount to when you put them all together? In your own, in your own life story, what do they amount to? The, the, piece, the, piece, the, the piece I wrote is a, sort, is a personal essay, right? It's, mm -hmm. These are my personal reflections. Mm -hmm. And... And I know that there's something that's very selfish, that's very individualistic about wanting to come back, about wanting to find meaning for yourself, right? It's uh, it's not this, you know, holy cause that you're sacrificing yourself uh, uh, for for some higher good. It's not really that, but it's trying to uh, to find yourself in this place mm -hmm. uh, and to 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 do things, to be with others here, uh, and to build things here. I think that's the, that's the sort of attachment that, uh, that drives me or that drove me. And, uh, and I did, you know, you, you, you do, whether it's uh, personal relationships, whether it's uh, 
um, creative pursuits, there's a different taste to them here. Um, and this didn't change, you know, with, with time. I right. didn't, uh, that's the one thing that doesn't change. I think that's a consistent. That, that's something I think I can always look back on and know that it's there. And I, I'm going to get into the perpetual return and it's the way you end the piece. As for those who leave, we imagine their survival elsewhere. We judge it, envy it, long for it. We imagine them happy, going about their daily lives, making plans they can keep. And with each season, we wait for their return. I would agree with the last part only. We wait for their return. And I don't know, and this is from my side, I'll start with my own take. I don't know if uh, they're happy. I think they're comfortable and they're stable. And they found something that doesn't exist in Lebanon. Uh, but I don't think they're happy. And I don't know if, I, you know, I think every, every opportunity to be happy abroad, the moment you can return, I think the overwhelming majority yearn to return. I don't know if they will always return, especially when they establish roots elsewhere. But I think happiness is very difficult to find abroad. I think to the majority, it's very difficult to feel at home anywhere else. And home, I think, becomes a very difficult uh, thing to build once you leave. Curious about your own sort of perpetual return. When you left, and you decided to pursue a PhD away from Lebanon and all the struggle that that entails, let alone the PhD, the PhD is actually maybe the easiest thing. <laughs> <laughs> that Everything else is complicated too and even more. That includes getting funding, that includes saying goodbye to loved ones. That also includes maybe having to make a choice at some point. Do you establish a career and let go? Try to let go? Or do you sort of wait every, any, any opportunity to return? I'm curious about you and trying to establish a world abroad and then in 2016 you're back. Did you find that happiness or that, did you find your home away from Lebanon? And if you didn't, is that really the reason why you ended up maybe against the advice of loved ones, maybe against the advice of mentors or whatever, academic pursuits, that you decided to return? And you're still there. So just your own personal trajectory in, in that sense, and that longing for something that you can't find abroad. Yeah. I think there were moments of home, right? Moments where you feel at home abroad and it's the certain experiences that you have, uh, some of which you'll never experience in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. It's the home you make with other people, with people you love, with your friends, with people who take care of you. So you do find, uh, you do find home. But I think the, this um, one thing to return, I think for, I mean, for me personally, I left when I was very uh, young um, and I came of age, right, in, in the United States. That's where I had many of my formative experiences. And part of me wanted to, to, you know, see what life is like as an yep. adult in Lebanon. Uh, what does independence mean? Mm -hmm. uh, what does freedom mean? Uh, to be lived there in that place. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, I wanted to try this. And um, I knew that this was the moment for it to happen because I, I would see around me that the longer you spend, the longer time you spend there, the more rooted you become. Uh, the more projects you have, it becomes harder to just pick up and leave. So I knew that I was in a transitional moment and I could make that, that shift. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, also, I also needed, because maybe I left with a desire for, you know, independence. Um, I wanted to uh, leave, maybe uh, uh, live on my own, uh, uh, 
uh, away from all the uh, comfort and uh, protection, you know, all all those things that pe- my mother had had woken I was gonna, around. <laughs> I was kind of waiting for you to say that one word. Yeah. Okay. So the missed calls yeah, exactly. from your mom. <laughs> <laughs> there was that desire that that drove my decision then, but then years later there was there was now a new desire and a desire of being close to her because my sense of time was changing, and now the passage of time away from her uh, was something that's that started to scare me a little bit. Okay, and I I want to push here delicately. Did you return for those reasons? Uh, those are some of, I mean, those are definitely some of the reasons, but I also knew that I wanted with, with everything that I had uh, learned, uh, the, the new ideas I had, there was, I wanted to sort of see what I could do with them in Lebanon, mm. nowhere else. Mm. Right. And that had a particular meaning for me. Right. And I, I share that sentiment exactly. <laughs> Particularly as a teacher, because I was coming back to teach in the university, for, you know, at the UB where I graduated right. from. So it's it's not a, an attachment to UB per se, but it was about what does it mean to to teach these things uh, to to what used to be, you know, myself. So I probably also projected my, you know, I saw myself in, in the um, in my future students and 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 teaching as an experience there because I had been teaching American students, right, for, for years there. And I wanted to see what it was like. This is a mental gymnastics question, not, not a math exam, just a mental gymnastics. Does the feeling of returning feel better than the feeling of leaving? Mm, it's a, it's a difficult question. I'll start from my side. It, yeah. It never feels good to leave. And I, for all the reasons one leaves, and maybe there's a, maybe there are specific reasons to get on that plane and, and say goodbye. But that feeling of coming back, it can't be taught. I don't know a feeling that feels better. And it's silly because it sounds almost like an immature, uh, almost a reckless emotion. But that's reality for me. I never feel good leaving. That includes all the promises of what you said abroad that simply don't exist in Lebanon. They're they're not there. But they, uh, they don't add up to that raw feeling of return at least on, uh, from my side. So that's, I mean, for you, is it, a, is, it a more, is it a more equal feeling that you have your, you're able to see positive reasons to leave and you're also able to see negative reasons to come back and it's more leveled, at, at least in, in your experience? I think there was excitement of the, you know, the unknown when you leave. So there was definitely that. Yeah. But... There's something that when you know, when you come back here, there's always there's something waiting for you. There's someone there's someone waiting for you. Yeah. There's a sense of, um, you know, when when I would leave Philadelphia, Philadelphia where I used to live, and and come back, the worst uh, the worst time to be there was actually the return yeah. to the city because you really feel, uh, especially if it's in winter, you really feel your you know your your isolation. Yeah. Um, which which was never the case when I was when I would return here when I when I'd be coming back to Beirut. So there is something there, at, at least in terms of that the it is home, and maybe that's what home does to somebody. It just makes mm-hmm. them feel like they're themselves, and that the the discomfort can be sort of uh, measured. Because otherwise, why the hell would we still call that place home? I mean, given every other reason, given every justified reason to, if you get a visa, to leave and never come back. There's ample, ample evidence <laughs> for sort of pursuing a life outside and, and, and you, you'd be given the green light. It's okay. You, you've, you've earned that departure. But then, it still doesn't add up. Come back. I... 
I'm going to maybe take the conversation a slight, uh, to a different place, but it, it touches on this. Um, I like the way you, you titled a, uh, the Rusted Radishes piece, Aftershock. And for me, this is the most eloquent rambling I've read. <laughs> and I say rambling carefully, not discrediting your writing. But it is, it is a jolted sort of, it's almost like short phrases stuck together, trying to react very quickly to a traumatic event. And I, I, I like that in a way both can be read at the same time because they overlap and sort of the more recent piece is a proper reflection, well sort of well versed and well thought out. But Aftershock is, I mean, it could, it feels like it could be sort of real time. I'll quote you to you again. It was not an accident. Those who killed us are still roaming free. They are eating their dinner, tanning by the pool, counting their dollars as we rush to help friends clean their homes, take turns consoling those who lost theirs, weeping for all the strangers we lost, and distributing sandwiches to broom-yielding youth. For you, and you're there and you, you, you survived. And I, you, the way you describe it is, is harrowing itself that you're sort of rushing through dust, eight floors down, you're seeing people traumatized. Could you imagine yourself being being away when this happened? Being in Philadelphia or being wherever with your American students, <laughs> trying to explain to them what happened? Or do you feel satisfied that the murderers, the thugs, the worst crop of Lebanese political establishment uh, are roaming free the way you said, and you and, and others are doing what they should be doing. Um, I remember being there when tragedy, where some when some sort when some tragedy happened here, mm. and I remember how bad it felt uh, to to be so distant. I mean, I we talked about being distant when the the garbage protest started, right? That's a different one thing to be there, but yeah, when tragedy hits. Uh, that distance is um, is unbearable, yeah. and the inability to, and and you're seeing you know, everything is mediated to you, so you don't really have a sense of the scope really or the scale. Right. Um, and and now, I I I I could, you know, I would hear my friends who live abroad talk about their deep sense of alienation and isolation. Uh, abroad, because whereas we were all collectively uh, in shock and collectively grieving, and we all understood, you know, exactly where we were, what we were thinking, uh, how our bodies felt, um, they were there, you know, at their jobs the next day, no one understanding, you know, what right. had happened to them, they couldn't talk to anyone. Yeah. And so I think for them, that it's a trauma and it's a different kind of trauma. Um, that that they have endured and that they're still enduring. The only comfort I had was when people close to me said that it makes them happier knowing that I'm safe. That was maybe the only time I thought twice about how I was feeling, but then I shook it off. I was like, I really, actually, that still doesn't matter. <laughs> really wish I was there. And you, in a way, you add to recent writing by Lina Munzer, who, who uh, spoke about resilience. And I like the way your, your take on it. The injunction to rise feels offensive, abusive even. We are still collecting ourselves. It is too early for resilience. The myth can wait. We are too broke, too sick, and barely alive to get into character, to act out a stale national mythology of survival expected from us. Resilience, despite its current status in the Lebanese scene, is really what kept things together in previous crises, in previous episodes of despair. A war with Israel, a uh, repeated assassinations, which you, which you also wrote about, economic crises, the, everything that could go wrong in Lebanon that, that went wrong. Resilience, I thought always as that optimism, that that's all we have this time around. It's looked at very differently. So w without resilience now, is there any sort of, ex excuse the cliche, but light at the end of the tunnel? 
that suffering population that is rightfully letting go of that myth, or maybe, maybe keeping it on the back burner for now, that uh, resiliency is not the right sort of feeling or, or expression right now. I mean, is there anything for another expression that could take hold? And that, that includes rage. I mean, things that you would want to see happen to just maybe the, at the last stage uh, bring about some change. Or in, in your eyes, is it, is it at this point, is it too late this round that maybe now it's sort of, we'll have to wait again. You stink until October 2019, that's four or five years. Uh, it was 10 years when the Houston crisis happened that Lebanon had witnessed real protests. So are we just, are we waiting now for the next round? I think the problem with resilience is um, two things that really are, as you know, come up when we talk about it, is the, the sense of adaptability, that you can adapt to any, to whatever is thrown at you. And adaptability it allows you to survive, right? But it also allows survival, as you were saying, despite justice. Mm. And so, and, and we can take examples that are more, you know, everyday mundane examples, like the fact that you, we adapted to a life without electricity, right? right? We <laughs> That's true. To a life. And those who can pay, they can, they can still live comfortably, right? Right. right. Uh, and you don't even have to feel that there is no uh, electricity. And so you normalize, you normalize uh, dispossession, you normalize injustice. And this is what, what the problem with resilience being the thing that, that we are most uh, uh, proud about or that, you know, this injunction to, to be and remain resilient. We need to be other things. We need to denormalize the state that we are in. Uh, we need to also say that, uh, no, there's also the resilience of that regime that we've been living under. What about that resilience? Right, right. Is that a good kind of resilience? Yeah. That's a terrible, something we need to fight. But as I, and taking it a step further, because I always hear this and I feel this, that we need to, we need to, and we don't. So is this a, I guess what I'm asking, it's maybe not a, the best way of asking it, but are, are we ossified now to the point that it's just it's beyond beyond hope this time around because everything that you describe which is it has taken its toll and the patience of people the the suffering of people that have tried and tried and tried and then also sort of hearing those demands and we need to do all of the above and yet it just doesn't happen I mean I'm gonna quote you to you one more time it's the last words of that piece. We still live here. We are still alive. What a tragedy. I mean, the, that's the fact that we're alive has now become the, the hope, if you will, or that's the shining light that we're, that we're alive. But that's not, that's not enough to, to bring change. So, I, I mean, is it, is it past now? Is it past that, that we can't do it this time around? Or are you still hopeful? At least, at least this round, this current round. It's it's not it's not about hope uh, mm. or despair. It's you're accepting you're accepting how shitty everything is, and you're accepting this sense of of doom and impossibility. But I think this idea of change happening when people storm the streets, and you said you know people have jobs, people need to return to normal. Mm -hmm. We can't be in the streets uh, uh, forever. I think it's about organizing, it's about political organizing, it's about um, solidarity, it's about networks of solidarity. And I think, no, I don't think we have tried, you know, to organize and and have failed. I think there's still so much more mm -hmm. to be tried. And to pretend that we actually, when October 17 happened, we were organized or we were in a position to take over power. Right. You know, that's right. not the case. It's not about being able to Take, take on power. It's about the ability to act as a front of opposition and resistance. And this is what accumulates over time. Uh, this is what, you know, we, we, we build over time. And this is what October 17 was, you know, it was, it was that. It wasn't a, a, a front that exists that, you know, you said we were waiting for something, for big change to happen. We're just a front of... Uh, 
op- we're trying to build a front of, of resistance and opposition. And we're at that stage. We're not yet at a place where we can take power or claim power. So it may well mean that we've now maybe established the tools necessary. And we know what is missing. We know what is missing and what is needed. You know, but that is, for me, that's, that's the paradox. We, we all know it, and yet it still hasn't happened. And I think, I mean, it's high time. It's not, it's not something that can be delayed. And we're, we're still in that sort of, we, we live that paradox. I, I think it would be great if, uh, if all of these attempts eventually yield the fundamental change. But I would also like for our generation, the post-war generation, to be the ones that finally put the war behind us. And I just, I don't know, as time passes, I become increasingly maybe uh, pessimistic that it's not going to happen in the near term. The long term, it's, things can change. But at least now, it's, it's hard for me to see it happening. And I say this as someone who now ju- sort of juggles two lives, one abroad and one in Beirut. And uh, I think I juggle those lives because of that situation, that I, I, I am not able to fully establish myself in Lebanon. But I, I yearn for that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think um, bringing these two pieces together, I think uh, it would be great to have some justice instead of injustice in, in our lifetime. That said, <laughs> I've taken too much of your time. I don't <laughs> I, I look. I most of the episodes that I've done have been with, let's say, foreign policy experts or traditional academics and whatever, or uh, pundits and journalists and the like. Uh, it's rare for me to be able to just gauge the mind of somebody who's writing their personal essays, personal reflections. So, you, whether it's you or Lina Munzer several several months back, uh, this means a lot to me. And uh, a bit of inspiration to try writing my own things every now and then. So, with that said, thank you. And uh, good luck with these students that are prob- I hope are more taxing on you than I am. Thank you so much, Roni, for the, for the conversation. And for, you know, wanting to talk about the, uh, the essays. I'm glad they sparked the conversation between us, at least. So, thank you for putting this together and reaching out. My pleasure. I hope, I hope you know, there's something... Insightful was uh, was said at some point. If so the num- if the numbers go down, it's my fault, not yours. <laughs> okay. Or or both, maybe us together. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for listening, and a friendly reminder to help support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box below. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>